Well, I would like to now introduce John Norman, who is actually joining us from over in California, who's going to talk about cave excavation and small scale blasting. Take it away, John. All right. I'm going to throw my presentation up here. Uh, this is something I've, uh, so I'm actually a member of the Desert Dog Grotto. Uh, you guys uh, had the regional at our cave in Northern Arizona a few years ago. Um, I'm also a licensed blaster and I'm on the San Marino Sheriff's uh, cave rescue team. So I have this presentation I normally give to cave rescue people and I've condensed it down to about 20 minutes, but we're gonna talk a little bit about how you might go about digging and uh, removing rock in a kind of a cave environment. So uh, a little bit about you know safety before we get started. Drilling is kind of hazardous, it produces dust. Uh, silica is what you really wanna watch out for. Like Devin said, the N95 and even better P100 half face respirators are a good thing to wear. Uh, rock, any type of rock drill is typically very loud. It's percussive. You wanna wear hearing protection when you're drilling and all types of rock breaking, whether it's mechanical or chemical can produce high speed chips. So a little bit about safety, you know, all drilling produces dust, especially silica, the one you really wanna watch out for. Limestone is not the worst thing, but if you're especially in something like sandstone, that's very bad for your health. You wanna wear those masks. Uh, a little bit about why we wanna do this. We might wanna enlarge a cave passage. We might wanna effect a rescue, uh, relieve a boulder choke or something like that. We're talking about situations where we actually have to break rock as opposed to just mucking out, you know, existing plugs of rock and dirt. So there are basically kind of six points that I like to cover when we're talking about how to break rock. Generally speaking, it's very strong in compression. We build buildings and towers on top of it. But it's very weak in tension. And the secret to breaking rock is that we want to get behind or inside of it and we want to apply force that pulls it apart. So for contrast, we might have 7,000 PSI granite, but it might only be three to 500 pounds uh, strength and tension. Uh, it's much easier to break also when it has relief. That means two or, four, two or more free faces. So think about a corner or something like a boulder. If we don't have that, we have to create it mechanically. The typical method we gain access to the inside of rock is with drilling. And drilling or cracking the rock lets us apply that force from the inside out. Drill holes are also a great way of creating artificial relief if we're talking about like a sheer unbroken face. All rock drills work the same way. Basically it's whack and turn, whether it's by hand or mechanically or with an air drill, percussion or hitting fractures the rock, then the drill turns and exposes new surfaces of the rock and new working faces of the drill and does it again and again. And no matter whether you're doing this with a small cordless drill or by hand or whether you're using a big miners jack leg drill, you're starting the same way you're collaring or getting a hole started. And you're starting with a short drill bit or steel and swapping it in uh, with a longer one as the hole deepens. So this is a setup we use in the K rescue team for microblasting. We have a stub drill through like about an 18 inch drill uh, and we just keep swapping them out to keep them cool and give us straighter holes. Uh, there are all kinds of historical methods starting with hand drilling and these interesting pneumatic and steam drills. And you don't have to have a cool hat to be a good driller. Uh, hand drilling, this is the most difficult way to do it. The advantage though, you can tack it in. It doesn't need any equipment or power. These are typically used for up to about three quarters of an inch of hole. Uh, rock climbers, if you're a climber, you use these for bolting on lead. And you're talking 10 to 30 minutes for a hole and it's physically demanding. Uh, cordless drill, you know, these lithium ion tools have come a long way. Uh, you can drill, I, I used to say up to three quarter inch holes, actually even one inch hole sometimes. They're fast. They do create moderate dust and noise hazards. Uh, I recommend if you're gonna be doing drilling for excavation, that you get the largest battery you can, like a 36 volt if you get access to it. Uh, I have a really cool gasoline power drill. This is great for surface drilling and blasting called a peon jar. It can drill up to six feet deep. No air compressor, no lines, no truck. You can pack this thing in. These are used a lot by the National Park Service for trail blasting. Uh, and then the big guns, this is an air sinker drill. I think this is a 90 pound class. These can drill a one to three inch hole up to about 10 feet deep. You do basically need for even the very smallest one, a trailer tow behind air compressor supplied from the surface. So these are not small tools, you typically rent these. So ways we can break rock, a mechanical, that's wedging, prying, chiseling, jackhammering, it's slow. Anytime rock is already broken, this is a viable method. When you're talking completely virgin unbroken rock, this is gonna be a bad, hard, slow way to do it. But if we've already cracked it by some other means, uh, definitely chiseling, pry it apart using uh, pinch point bars. That's a six foot or five foot bar that has a wedge in the end. These can apply thousands of pounds of force. 
Uh, if you've ever taken like a USAR or any kind of rescue class for heavy rescue, they actually have you lift maybe a two or a three ton chunk of concrete with a couple of these and some timbers. They're very powerful tools, uh, but you have to have the rock already cracked or, or broken. Feathers and wedges, this is an ancient drilling technique, uh, great for flakes, large rocks, uh, things that you can get a little bit of relief started. Uh, you're basically drilling a hole anywhere from about half an inch all the way to two and three inch holes that are used with big air hammers and stuff. And you're putting these feathers, these little structures and sides in, you're greasing them up and you're driving a wedge in. And if you do that in a line, you can break a significant amount of rock with these, even an unbroken virgin rock, pretty cool. And microblasting, this is a relatively new technique. The cool thing about it, uh, there are at least two systems, one from Carol Bassett, uh, BMS, inventor of the micro rack, uh, another one uh, from a newer company called Sierra Blaster. Uh, they both uh, use a propellant, uh, like a gunpowder type charge, smokeless powder, that does something called deflagration to detonation. We'll get to that, but basically it can build up a lot of pressure uh, in a small hole if it's well confined and it can break rock. Uh, the cool thing about this is you do not need an ATF license to run one of these. This is a Sierra Blaster. It uses electric cartridges, a 10 millimeter hole up to, I think about 24 inches deep. They sell some really nifty drill bits uh, for running the system. Uh, these are the cartridges. The one on the right is the electric, or the one on the left is an electric primed one, I think. And then there's, it comes in a little sleeve with the, uh, the leads and everything already on it. it. Has an electric match and about a gram of powder. You can put up to two boosters that basically have no powder next to them in the hole. Uh, this is the original, the Easy Break. It uses a little bit smaller 5 16 hole. Uh, and it uses a pneumatic shock tube type thing to light off a shotgun primer. Up to four inch, uh, up to four cartridges, also about the same uh, net propellant weight. Uh, the only disadvantage of this guy, it, it's no electricity, which is nice, but uh, it is not waterproof. Uh, it uses like a CO2 or compressed air to uh, set it off. Uh, another method, which is quiet, uh, no danger of flying rock, it's expanding grout. This is where you drill a hole. It's possible with a one inch hole, one and a half works better. You drill them pretty tightly, like eight to 12 inches apart. And then you pour this expanding concrete in it, it sets up and it will break off uh, lots of rock. Um, this stuff is caustic. It's very exp it's expensive too. You're talking about like a hundred bucks for, you know, I think 44 pounds. And that's enough to do about nine, uh, 36 feet of inch and a half hole. So it's not a cheap way to go. And it's, you know, a pretty unpleasant material to handle and it's slow, but it does work. So when we get into high explosives, uh, this is something you're gonna you need a minimum an ATF license, a federal explosives license to possess. Uh, there may be other permits such as a state blaster's license or a county permit. These are available in sizes ranging from grams to many pounds of explosives. Uh, the cool thing about explosives though, a small team with fairly simple equipment can move literal tons in cubic yards, dump trucks of rock if you want to, but it is, fairly dangerous. It can produce fumes, fly rock, and an air blast. So some of the equipment we use, an elect we have a circuit tester, we use an electric uh, blasting machine typically, or a shock tube initiator, and we want to be far away when this happens. Uh, on the left, we have what are called non-L or non-electric detonators used in most modern mining. That's a plastic tube dusted with uh, like a flash powder, and it has a blasting cap that goes down the hole. On the right, we have the older style. Uh, those are electric. So you apply an electric current and that thing explodes out the end and initiates uh, things like dynamite and other explosives. Uh, this is a stick of emulsion, which as you're talking about explosives earlier, this is a more modern product, very safe to handle. It's kind of made out of ammonium nitrate and some ingredients that uh, give it a fuel and an oxidizer blended together. The inside of this looks kind of like putty or cookie dough. And it's very safe to handle. You can drop this, it, it's not gonna go off. Uh, blasting cap gets uh, punch, stuck in the end of the powder punch, taped up and put down a hole. Uh, this is your typical dynamite. This is powder ditch. It's nitroglycerin, nitroglycol, does the same thing. Fumes are a little nastier, doesn't store as well, but it has a little more punch. Uh, deck cord, this is like an explosive rope. It's very powerful, uh, but small. You can use this for linking things together and some other techniques I'll show you. And this is a really interesting thing for cave use, especially. It's called a 1.4 cartridge. It basically lets you have gunpowder like a microblaster, but in a bigger format. Less fly rock. Uh, all of these products are used the same way. You're going to put a charge at the bottom of the hole, fill it up with gravel, clay, dirt, 
uh, sand, whatever, and you're going to set it off so that the blast is contained in the rock. Other ways of doing it in the surface, like sandbags, things the Park Service uses a lot. Uh, these are shape chargers. This can bust up a big boulder with high explosives without drilling, directs the force down. Uh, the deck cord, you can drill lots of small holes and then do what's called a pre-split, bring them down the hole and snap a whole rock face off. Um, main dis disadvantage of using a lot of high explosives underground is you have fumes and some air blast and you often need large diameter drilling to make it happen. So this is a, uh, we put a new entrance in, we dug out the west entrance and blasted out to be large enough to pass people at Cathedral. These were 40 gram uh, gunpowder 1.4 cartridges, stemmed with sand and sandbags, and they did a pretty good job. These products are available from five to actually over 500 grams. They don't produce a lot of fumes. They can be had in smaller diameters. Uh, when you're doing this, like especially outdoors, it's nice to have heavy equipment to move the bigger rocks or to get yourself down to bedrock. Rock drills do not work in sand and dirt, but this is a before, this is after. So we move it about five cubic yards, probably 10,000 plus pounds of rock. And uh, you can see this was, I think, 150 grams of propellants going off. Uh, I'll show you a video. This wasn't terribly violent as explosions go. You know, very safe for the cave. So that right there probably moved a yard to two yards of rock with very little air blast and relatively little fly rock and no danger to the bats and so forth. You see it's opened up that air just, that dust is sucked away from the cave breathing. So, you know, it's possible to do some pretty gentle blasting these days with these modern products. And uh, it's nice to have a lot of stuff in your arsenal. Uh, I think those are the prepared slides we have on this. And I wanted to go through them kind of quickly and maybe have a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah, we definitely have time for questions. Uh, so by all okay. means, um, if folks want to unmute or if you want to put them in the chat, whatever you'd prefer. Hey, John, I'll uh, ask a quick question. First off, great presentation. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. And if you do have a chance to go to the workshop on micro shaving, uh, just for everybody else, like highly recommended. It's 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 a great. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. So if we do a convention, uh, I will be working on that one. I'm going to bring the Sierra Blaster up there and probably the easy break. And you guys can try that hands on. Yeah, I attended one of those at the old the Pennsylvania. We went to a quarry, and it was a boulder that must have been four feet square, and he used the equivalent of a thirty-eight caliber shot. And we put a huge crack in it, and it's really amazing if it's focused. Oh, sure. And if you if you uh, focus it and tamp it, it can do amazing stuff with a remarkably small charge. Oh yeah, um, it. it you know, a, a couple of people, the backpack full of tools can reduce like a car sized rock to pieces you can haul away if you're patient. Awesome. We have a couple of questions that are showing up in chat. One from Gabe is Are there restrictions on homemade versions of the Easy Break or Sierra? Okay. So, yes, there are. The Sierra and the Easy Break have an ATF exemption they applied for and got. It's specifically called an SED or special explosive device. So, that does not need a license from ATF. Uh, there are a couple of states, I think Massachusetts, it's a little weird about that, but generally no. Um, when you do it for homemade use, uh, you can buy black powder up to 50 pounds a year for cultural or sporting use. You can also buy smokeless propellants for reloading, but the ATF considers those to be like a personal exemption, something you don't need a powder license, a federal explosive license or a magazine for, if they're used for small arms and similar things. But if you use them for blasting, the, the ATF does consider it a regulated activity, and you are supposed to have an ATF license if you, even though you can buy those materials over the counter, if you use them for blasting. Uh, you're probably not going to get caught, but if you're trying to get public funding or do this in a, you know, a park or a state, you know, land or somewhere where you have to get permission, they're likely going to check on that stuff and they probably will not let you do that. All right, and we have one, another question in the chat. This one from Debbie. Uh, have you considered what new entrances do to the natural airflow of the cave? Yes, uh, in that particular case, we think it was an historical entrance that had collapsed. We, we did excavate it out and we put an airtight uh, airlock door on it. So that's absolutely a consideration. You can dry out a cave or you can introduce predators. That's a real problem if you do that indiscriminately. 
All right, we definitely have time for more questions. Uh, so if anyone has additional ones, feel free to unmute yourselves. Um, we can also open it up to general discussion at this point because um, we have the time to uh, ask any questions that maybe occurred to you after the talks or uh, any other um, thoughts for the speakers thus far. We said another All right, one. I'll start. Okay, uh, actually we had one pop in the chat first, oh, so I'm gonna okay. that one and then let you go, please. Um, so uh, Matt asks, what was involved in getting your BLAST license? Okay, so uh, I had started off, I got this originally because we needed to get some training for the cave rescue team because we do encounter old explosives and mines. And uh, I found a place called American Explosives Group that does blaster training. And uh, I took that class just because we want some awareness training. And I really liked it, so I kept uh, on that path. Um, basically, in order to get a federal explosives license, you need to be over 21, uh, not have a criminal record, not use drugs. So no, you don't need, you want to not have a medical marijuana card. You do, you want to relinquish that. Uh, you're going to need a powder magazine somewhere, so a safe place to store explosives. So my uh, case, I rented an old gravel pit from someone that has some land, and uh, I found some magazines at an auction. They're steel boxes lined with hardwood. They're set up out in the desert, and they have a caretaker that can look after it. Otherwise, you have to be there every seven days and check in on them to make sure they haven't been tampered with. Uh, I also had to apply and take a test to get a state blasters license in California. And then there's a county permit when and they want insurance and some things, but those are all doable things. They're not necessarily cheap or easy uh, if you haven't, you know, been in that industry or something or have a lot of connections, but it is doable for a normal person. Awesome. Uh, so I think Blaze, you had a question, right? Yeah, thanks, sir. So you seem very informed on the National Park Service's uh, blasting methods. I'm curious where you're getting that information from. Uh, they actually have their blasters manual published online. I can drop a link to that if you guys are interested. Uh, they I have a lot that, of great yeah. small scale techniques that are applicable to this stuff. They also use a product a lot called Kinepak, which is a two part mix it on site explosive, which is really nice because it's safe to transport and uh, you know, it's less regulated in that respect. You don't need to have a hazmat delivery to, to take it out and use it. I was curious, is that a water gel uh, explosive? That uh, No, so it's actually ammonium nitrate and uh, nitromethane. It's a liquid and solid you mix together in a bottle, in the waterproof bottle, and then it becomes very similar to like a 60% dynamite. That explosive I had earlier, the emulsion is more similar to water gel. But yeah, they've developed a lot of nice uh, small scale techniques that, you know, we've also used it to fix our road and do some other land management stuff around the cave properties that we work with in the underground uh, Conservancy, uh, you can you can do things like felling hazard trees, getting boulders off roads, pretty cool. In some cases, it's less impact. If you have two people come out with a hand drill, drill it and blast it, that's probably a lot better than bringing a road grader and a bunch of equipment out. You know, it's probably less disruptive to the environment. Uh, yeah, John, this is Paul. Hey, uh, could you speak on the uh, uh, gases that might be involved in microblasting in the cave and how do you deal with that situation underground? So microblasting, I really wouldn't worry about it. You're, you're converting a gram of basically nitrocellulose to primarily carbon dioxide, water, a little bit of carbon monoxide, but there just isn't enough of it to cause a problem. And even those 1.4 cartridges where you have up to a few hundred grams of that, I still wouldn't worry about it. Uh, high explosives, you definitely worry about it. Uh, first of all, you can be talking about pounds of material. You know, you'd be concerned if you burn five pounds of wood inside a closed space, but they also can produce some nasty things like nitric oxides, which uh, even in pretty small quantities can be deadly. So in mines, they're typically gonna blast and then ventilate it thoroughly before they let anyone come back in. On the surface, you don't really have to worry about it, but underground, that's a problem. You'd probably wanna blast and then come back the next day or follow the breathing cycle if you used a lot of explosives uh, or stick with the 1.4. Uh, that would be the gunpowder products that are you know, in gram sizes. I don't think you're gonna have to worry about it, the air quality too much. It's more of the dust at that point. 